So uh, for our next session, I want to invite Rima and Ilan on the stage, please. Okay, so, um, so just to give you their background, uh, Ilan Satriavan is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at University of Gajah Mada in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. He's also the chief of the policy working group, a policy think tank under the National Team for Acceleration of Poverty Reduction. Uh, the acronym for that is TNP2K. You will hear a lot of that from Rima. You'll also hear a lot about TNP2K in my presentation. Uh, TNP2K sits under the office of the vice president. In the past, uh, uh, Ilan was the lead evaluator in the monitoring and evaluation unit of TNP2K, senior research fellow at JPAL, and a consultant for the World Bank. Um, welcome, Ilan. Uh, and then we have Rima Hanna. Rima is an, uh, a professor of Southeast Asian Studies at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and the founding uh, director of our, of our Indonesia office, which is also called the Southeast Asia office. She's also the founding co-chair of our social protection sector and the social protection initiative. You heard a lot about some of the work happening in Togo. That's exactly the sort of work that uh, happens here. Okay, all the fun facts, Rima. <laughs> okay, Rima has the honor of being my only co-PI. Uh, it's not the other way around, Rima. Like, uh, and, and it was the only one RCT I did, and it was so brilliant. I said, okay, I never need to do a second one. Rima taught me just about everything I need to know. Uh, so that, that was great. And then as part of that RCT, I also discovered that Rima's biggest fear is crossing an Indian road. Uh, in traffic because there are, no, there, are no, there are no red light, no markers, and so we had a lot of fun memories crossing roads in Bangalore. So with that, it's over to both of you. Uh, okay, I'm a lot shorter than Iqbal. Thank you for having me here today. It's funny, I was thinking about Pascaline's speech, um, and it's very similar to my own experience. I was a grad student in 2005, and I came in um, to do this economics PhD, very interested in public policy, very interested in human rights, a lot of, because of my background. And then I got there and it was like all math. <laughs> um, um, and I was like not sure I was gonna stay in grad school. And it was, um, uh, and it was, um, and then I got the opportunity to work with Esther, to work with Sanil Malanathan, to work with Abhijit, um, and go to India and really learn how I could use economics, how I could use data. Um, to think about how I could learn and use that learning to make people's lives better. And it really changed, um, it knocked me onto a completely different career path, um, one that I am very, very grateful for. Um, and it's also given me a lot of opportunities, uh, including uh, the partnership activities I'm gonna talk about today. So today, um, we're gonna talk about one evaluation, uh, the BPT, BPNT impact evaluation, which was part of a broader collaboration uh, we've had um, with, uh, with um, uh, many people within, the in, uh, within um, academia and the Indonesian government, including Pakalan, um, who's here today, um, to try to think about how can we improve public policy um, and ultimately uh, try to use it to be a force for good in people's lives in Indonesia. So, you know, a question that, it's a fundamental question that a lot of governments worldwide struggle with is if we want to improve food security, um, we want to improve nutrition, how do we do it? Uh, do we do direct food distributions, which is actually very common in most of the world, or do we think about doing it in different ways? For example, you could give out direct cash transfers, or you could do something, digital um, food stamps, which is similar to what we do in the U.S., where I'm from. And so, like other countries, Indonesia has really struggled with this question about how to really think about um, how to think about food security, especially in the context of a lot of uh, nutritional issues, uh, high rates of stunting relative to income levels. And so, in 1999, um, to try to address some of these issues, Indonesia launched um, what has become um, the largest social assistance program in the country which was uh, called Raskin at the time, uh, which is basically rice for the poor. Um, and so it was a food distribution program where basically subsidized rice was uh, given out to targeted households. Um, but there were a number of key challenges of this program. One is that um, a lot of households that were actually eligible to receive the program didn't receive it. Now some of it is because rice just fell off the truck, and some of it was that a lot of rice was going to households that were actually pretty well off and not necessarily in need of food subsidy. 
So we, uh, you know, there. Ever, you know, we've been having many conversations for years as a group that you know this that doing the direct food subsidy might not be the best way to actually improve health and nutrition because of all these issues. But there was really no political will to change the program. So we first started a number of different research projects to say, well, then given that this is the policy, what can we do to help? And so we ran a number of RCTs um, with our collective team here. Um, one of them was to try to increase transparency in the program, and that one was actually, it was very effective, and it was scaled up nationally across the country um, to try to improve social assistance programs at the time of the a, a big fuel subsidy cut some years ago. Um, another one was looking at if we privatize the last mile delivery of these food transfer programs, and we did a number of these studies, and you know, there were things on the margin that helped. Um, nothing was a silver bullet. Nothing was like a big, it really shocks the program to be much better. Um, but we were trying to help, and some of these things made, made, made quite a difference. Um, but it was also important because with each study, we built up a sense of trust, a understanding um, of methods, capacity building, and really a culture of evaluation where all of us across both academia and, um, and within the government are, were working together to really try to solve some of these problems. And so in 2017, um, there was a very unique opportunity, I think Pakalan's gonna talk a bit about it, where suddenly the policy landscape changed and it was possible to move away from Raskin and to move towards electronic food stamps. It was really exciting. Um, as I said, it went from about uh, 10 kgs a month of free government rice to being able to provide, uh, you get this digital ID card that lets you buy rice or eggs. Okay. So, you know, with a, with a lot of national reforms, they're not done all at once. You have to transform the institutions. So instead of now trucking around race, you need um, shops that have an electronic card system that could get the debit cards. You need to be thinking about how you, how you move, you know, you need to get debit cards to people. So you need to work with the banks to do so. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. So the idea was going to get phased in over five years, and that was the way it was put, uh, four or five years, and that was the way it was put into the national budget. So in the 2018 to 2019 round, about 105 districts, or about a fifth of the country of Indonesia, was gonna get moved over in those two years. Um, and, but they, all these districts were perfectly, <laughs> perfectly fine to switch over, so the question is which one should go first? So actually, I got a phone call from Vivi Yulaswati, um, who is in the Indonesian government, um, in the Ministry of Planning, um, and we had, worked with, um, we had worked with her before, and she's like, uh, you know, Rima and Ben, um, if I give you, everybody's fighting over which districts go first. If I give you the list of districts, can you randomize them? And we're like, okay. <laughs> so we, you know, we randomized the list. Um, we, uh, it went back and forth. Like, then we would get a new list because suddenly which districts were within the 105 change. Anyways, it went back and forth. But we uh, worked with the government to actually randomize, build the randomization into the national reform structure. Um, and again, I say this, it would not have been possible if we hadn't all worked together on evaluation and built up this, this culture of, of trust and um, built up the, the set of toolkit to know that this was even feasible. Otherwise, I don't think I would have gotten that call that day. Um, and so there were 105 districts. As I said, this is about a fifth of Indonesia. So this was like, oh my God, how are we going to do this? Um, and we... We just, um, you know, 42 districts were going to receive the program, 63 would get it the next year. And it, they're really spread all across Indonesia, which is great, so it'll tell you a lot about what's happening all over the country, but we're like, how do we afford surveys to actually do this? Um, and so, working with Tan Pedua Ka, with, um, uh, my co-author Pakalan, who's here, um, and with, uh, we, we approached the Census Bureau, and we got them to add, um, we wrote a, a social protection module that was uh, incorporated into the National Sample Survey. So twice a year, um, the Census Bureau does a random sample of, all, of individuals across Indonesia that's representative at the district level, and so then we could use that to um, actually analyze it. And in fact, uh, it's changed over time um, as the social protection programs have changed since then, but the module is still in there, so it allows us to really monitor what's happening with social protection programs over time. Um, okay, so as I said, you know, doing something of this scope, it is not something that you know, any of us can do alone. Um, we worked very closely 
with uh, Bapanas, the planning ministry, with Chan Pedro Aka, um, uh, who Pakalan is, is part of. Um, we worked with a statistics agency. We worked with the Ministry of Social Affairs. We worked with the banks because they were doing all the debit cards and the electronic machines. And it really took a lot of, um, a lot of trust. It really took a lot of really trying to understand the, the, the challenges each different partner was facing and really thinking about how we could come together to do an evaluation of the scope on such an important topic. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to uh, share with you um, a video that's going to describe the evaluation and the results. I mean, I'm doing this for two reasons. One, because it, it probably more eloquently describes the results than I would. But also, um, this was part of, you know, for me, it's very important that you don't just do evaluations, but you communicate them in ways that gets the message out there in ways that people understand. So this is a video we showed as part of a joint event um, between Jay Paul Saya and Tan Pedro Aka to try to educate policymakers and even the public. Um, so it was on Zoom, it was during COVID era, I think like a thousand people showed up on Zoom to try to understand um, the, the issues, um, uh, the, the evaluation and the results of the program. So I will ask Sarah if you could help turn it on. Impact evaluation of the transition from Rastra to BPNT. Preliminary findings. The impact of the transition from in-kind food assistance to electronic food vouchers. Evidence from Indonesia. The Rastra program, formerly called Raskin, is Indonesia's largest targeted social assistance program. Since 2017, the Indonesian government has gradually transitioned this food assistance program from in-kind rice delivery to non-cash food transfer or BPNT. To evaluate this reform, the government worked together with researchers to answer what is the impact of this transition on the assistance received by beneficiaries and their welfare. The Rastra program, or previously called Raskin, was initially designed to provide subsidized rice amounting to 15 kilograms per month to approximately 15.5 million households and later changed to 10 kilograms of free rice per month in 2018. The reform program, BPNT, distributes assistance using electronic vouchers amounting to 110,000 rupiah per month transferred to beneficiaries' bank account. Using card as a means of transaction, beneficiaries can use the e-voucher to purchase rice and eggs at a network of bank agents or e-warongs. This is the largest social assistance reform in 20 years. The study To understand the effect of this monumental reform, researchers in collaboration with the government of Indonesia conducted an impact evaluation using the randomized evaluation method. The randomized evaluation method allows us to isolate changes in outcomes such as program delivery and welfare that are caused only by the program, excluding other external factors. The evaluation involved 105 districts across Indonesia. Researchers assisted the government to randomly assign these districts into two groups. The first group transitioned to BPNT in 2018 while the comparison group transitioned to BPNT in 2019. By comparing these two groups, we were able to understand the impact of the reform on program targeting, assistance received by the beneficiaries, and beneficiary welfare in 2018 to 2019. The evaluation found that, Compared to in-kind transfers, vouchers were more effective in reducing poverty by concentrating assistance toward targeted groups. Poverty among poor and near-poor households in districts implementing BPNT was reduced by 20%. This was possible because BPNT reduced the probability that assistance is received by households who were above the eligibility criteria cutoff. Those who were below the criteria cutoff received 45% higher subsidy compared to below cutoff households in districts still implementing in-kind rastra. Under BPNT, targeted households do not only receive more, but the rice they receive is also of higher quality. 
they also consume more eggs. With these results, our final question would be, is BPN tech costly? Even with the increased effectiveness in delivering assistance, the administrative cost for BPNT is even lower than the already low cost for Rastra. BPNT is a large-scale reform that affects the lives of many families. This evaluation finds evidence that the reform is a positive step towards optimizing social assistance and improving the welfare of citizens. Stay updated on this study by visiting www.povertyactionlab.org. <laughs>no so um so as the video said you know this was it was really amazing that we were able to measure the impacts and know oh i see one minute whether or not it was working um and importantly um just knowing that the program actually got more aid into the hands of the poor um and as a result reduced poverty i think was um very heartening for many of us and you know this is why we do what we do um and so i will um i think i'm being kicked off the stage i will turn it over to pakilan Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's all covered by Arima, actually. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Esther and J. Paul team, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here uh, celebrating the 20 years uh, J. Paul amazing journey. and. Uh, I think we're all witnessing how significant actually J. Paul contributed to the uh, policy reforms uh, across uh, the world. So I'm going to add uh, what Rima already uh, presented, particularly on the policy side story and how the partnership between uh, J. Paul and Government of Indonesia uh, push contribute to the policy improvement in Indonesia. Uh, so. We start actually the partnership like 15 years ago, uh, 2008. Uh, it was start with the uh, targeting experiment study, 2008. Uh, Abhijit was part of the team, Rima, Ben Olken, uh, as well as the Indonesia uh, researchers. And uh, the result provide uh, a building blocks actually for the the development of the first Indonesia Beneficiary Unified Database in 2011. Uh, and later on, uh, si since then, actually, Indonesia used that Unified Database as the, the main source of the beneficiary data for all major social protection programs. That uh, study followed by many studies, so up to now, I guess, around 20, 20 studies, RCT-based studies uh, conducted uh, out of this uh, partnership, including the multiple RCT studies that informs on, inform the, the, the policy reforms of the food assistance programs. There was study that also testing between the two approaches in the tax reform. Uh, there are some ongoing studies as well on the uh, impact evaluation of the pre-employment job training programs and then targeting the their subsidy and, and et cetera. And we think that we call this partnership that that what make makes make make it works uh, because it, implicitly with this partnership we do all we do everything together between the research team and the, and the government starting from the you know defining the the research uh, the the policy question the policy issues faced by the government that need to be to be resolved it's not just like one way or uh, you know, single-handedly decision uh, about the, which topic that, that need to be researched. But it, it also goes beyond the discussion on the policy research. It's also like a involvement of the government policy during the implementation of the study, as well as a dissemination of the results. And I think we, we heard from the before, the, on also the partnership need to be formalized as well. Uh, so different people, different government uh, staff, I think will, will not change actually the, 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 the partnership. So how we set up the, the partnership in Indonesia? 
I think one modality is just like what typically happened in other countries. At least at the beginning in Indonesia, the, the JPA affiliated researchers uh, directly in touch with the government uh, uh, agencies, yeah, the, the owner of the program. But there's a other modality that actually happened at least like uh, uh, ten, since 10 years, 10 years ago. So where there's like a, what I call as the partnership facilitator. And that could be like the individual or the entities. In this case, uh, our TNP2K policy think tank actually in some way also like a play that, that kind of role. And among others, what, what this partner fac partnership facilitator does include like a facilitating the or opening up the discussion communication between the, G the research team and then the government agencies uh, and also uh, final uh, formalizing the, the partnership. It could be also representing the government, uh, particularly when it comes to defining the, the research uh, or policy uh, question, policy issues. But it, and in some way also sometimes uh, representing quote unquote JP, the research team uh, when the discussion with the government particularly involving the sensitive data need to be done and JPAL was shouldn't be part of it because uh, as the external researcher they need they don't they cannot actually access that that administrative uh, administrative data and and in some way Rima also mentioned about that we uh, we handle also like a JPAL what what the technical things that perhaps in other countries JPAL need to be done like a, you know uh, data analysis including like a, a desensitize the, the the data uh, administrative data that that JPAL actually should should shouldn't be shouldn't be involved because it contain like private private information. So now let let me move to the why reforming the, the food assistance program. Well, at least two reasons. And I think this is not perhaps the typical for Indonesia. Uh, I think it happened as well in other uh, developing countries. In Indonesia for, I think, data across the region shows that uh, uh, food constitutes like a 70%, around 70% of the poor monthly budget. And out of that 70%, like uh, close to 30% allocated for, for the rice consumption. Another fact that also make the why the, such program is actually important, the fact that uh, the, the food inflation tend to be higher and more volatile compared to general inflation. So that makes the, that make the government thinks that we should actually help the poor, yeah, providing the access to the poor and vulnerable to the, to the affordable uh, food. Uh, that's why Early in the 2000, government launched what 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 the government call as the Raskin program, rice for the program, initially as a subsidized, but later on uh, uh, transformed into like full full food assistance, and this is by by a size of the budget and then coverage of the uh, beneficiaries as the largest uh, social pro social assistance programs, but despite its importance, Raskin that still you know you know transporting or transferring the in-kind fail to meet like the what the government set as uh, six gov uh, what government set as the six accuracy performance indicator rima already mentioned some that uh, one it suffer from the substantial exclusion and inclusion error it uh, uh, it just like to actually give the beneficiaries the targeted beneficiaries like one third of what they supposed to receive it paid high uh, like a 20, uh, 30 percent uh, higher what what they're supposed to pay, and then frequent delays in many cases uh, they combine actually distribution two months three months into one month, uh, quality very poor, as well as uh, also the long and complicated uh, uh, administrative process, which which is I think one of the main reason why uh, this program actually failed to meet this uh, uh, performance indicator. So. Then we talk with the with the research team, the JPAL team. So what 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 can we do then? So we we think that uh, there's possibility actually to 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 reform the programs, and we de we de we decide to two studies. Abhijit mentioned in the morning, and Rima also also mentioned before. 
One is the in 2012, another in 2014. In 2012, we, we test actually whether introduction of the Raskin card will increase actually the, the, the targeting performance and the amount that received by the household. The 2014 study looked at the uh, test actually whether uh, private bid, uh, the, the bidding that, that allows the private entities and individuals actually can improve the performance of the programs. So this, from these two, two studies, we, government uh, were convinced actually to, 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 in, to reform the program. But we've, we found that because largely the design of the program was still similar. Uh, so we, we cannot actually push the, the new reform programs to the limit that they really help the poor. So learning from the Based on our discussion with the JPAL team, learning from other countries' experience, uh, previous, uh, uh, previous evidence, so we think that moving the program into voucher base actually will be like the, the important step. So we submit the proposal to the government in 2014, but it was the election year. So the, current, so the government that, you know, facing the election, they don't have really the incentive actually to change the programs. So we know that this is not the time. So what we wait a while, so when in early 2014, 2015, the president was there, the new president elected, new administration in the office, so we resubmit the proposal. Uh, Rima already mentioned about the feature of the program that it is based, it is like uh, giving the voucher with the voucher, they can purchase rice, but not just rice, but also like uh, eggs, uh, rice with any quality, any uh, type, also, like uh, there's no uh, significant uh, reduction in the cost of the program because they, they don't need like a transporting and storage uh, the the rice. Uh, empower the program. The new program will potentially also empowering the local economy because it involves the lo local shops. And then uh, one features that the new president actually likes because it also like it has the financial inclusion features because it, it involves both beneficiaries and then uh, local shop into the financial system. So the president, to make the story short, the president accept the, the proposal, but in, with two conditions. One, actually need to be piloted. I want to see the, the result of the pilot. And second, should we decide we go with this new program, the expansion of the program should be done gradually. So that's what we did in 2016. So it's, it, is, it is not, it, is not, it was not impact evaluation pilot, so it was just like, a, uh, well, a couple thousand beneficiaries, Raskin beneficiaries, we're giving actually the uh, additional voucher, additional benefit in, term, uh, in the form of the vouchers, and then where they can actually uh, still receive the Raskin, but also can, with the, with the voucher, they can purchase the, the food. Uh, and in almost all, in many aspects, like, uh, uh, a distance, uh, quantity of rice, uh, quality of rice, flexibility in getting the food. The new program, the new voucher program actually dominates these uh, this, uh, old Raskin programs. And 90% of the beneficiaries actually believe that they like or they prefer these this new, pro new programs. So this new, this very positive result from the 2016 led to the program initiation in 2017. Rima already mentioned about that. We start in 2017 with the 44 cities implement this new program, this uh, voucher-based program, BPNT, while the rest, around 470, actually remain with the old Traskin program, uh, with the plan that expansion should be done gradually until 2020 that will reach nationwide uh, full-scale implementation. So. As Rima mentioned, so we talked with the government, uh, particularly the National Planning Agency and the MOSA as the Ministry of Social Affairs as the owner of the program, how to, how to expand actually in the, in the fair way. So I think then that's the window where we convince actually both, this, both agencies that the, good, the, the best way actually to, to make the, the gradual expansion actually look fair is by doing it by a randomized uh, rollout. And that's what we did, and that's actually the story why we end up with that impact evaluation that what, what Rima already mentioned with all positive results. And 
the evidence uh, from that impact evaluation we we we, we submitted we reported uh, to we shared to the government that was one one of the video that come up from the dissemination and uh, that lead to the government to you know one actually to add the food item in the commodity that can be purchased by this by the by the voucher second in 2020 when the pandemic hit the country so the government actually used this bpnt program or the, the its new name called program sembako as the program expand this this program to cover more the new poor the new uh, vulnerables that hit by the by the pandemic so the program like a, from 15.5 expanded to like a close to 20 million in 2020 to cover the new poor and the new household so i think this this is just to close uh, my presentation so just to list some of the lesson from the partnership this 15 years partnership to sustain actually the reform momentum so where to start when it comes to establishing the partnership i think in our ex to, to our experience i think it's important to find the right champion or policy broker within the government that could also play a role as the partnership what I call as partnership facilitator. And it could be like the high level person, you know, who's thirsty about the achievement or the technical staff who understand rigorous evidence or the policy think tank with the mandate to generate the uh, evidence and the policy advices. Second is to establish the engagement uh, from, from beginning to the, to the end, meaning that involving all the partnerships should in, in, the, in this partnership the, the research team and then the government agency should work from A to Z. Of course, uh, the government doesn't have you know, the technical capacity, so we skip that. But the government need to be aware. So what, what all the process, uh, the, the, the project, the study that, 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 uh, that is going. Uh, and sometimes the partnership may need to go beyond the generating rigorous evidence. Because I think in our experience, yes, the government knows about the the evidence is good. The study, the evaluation is actually like very significant, very positive. But when it comes to use the evidence to formulate it, to use it actually to change the policy, to inform the policy, they don't have really the knowledge, they don't have really the capacity to, to do so. So the research team actually need to be there helping the government, facilitating the government to use that evidence to inform the, the new uh, the new policy or the new program. Last but not least, also important, I guess, in according to our experience, invest on the on the crea cre uh, creation of the future demand on rigorous evidence uh, for uh, policy reforms. Thank you very much. Thank you much, very much, Rima and Ilan. That was so inspiring, uh, really very touching. OK, so uh, for our last, uh, uh, last pairing, let me invite uh, Tavneet and Miriam on the stage, please. So Miriam Laker is the research director at Give Directly and a medical doctor with specialist training in tropical medicine, international health and research methods. Before joining Give Directly, she was a senior researcher in the United States East Africa Associated Malignancies Research Group. She also heads the Client Welfare and Development Board Committee of Reach Out Mabuya Community Health Initiative, which serves the urban poor in Uganda. Welcome, Miriam. Uh, Tavneet is a, is a force in herself, is how I always define Tavneet. She's a professor at MIT, um, Sloan School of Management. She's the founding co-chair of numerous things at Jepal. I had to make a list and uh, kind of, believe it or not, the list just keeps going, going, going. Uh, she's the founding co-scientific director of Jepal Africa, the, of the founding chair of our agriculture program, and has uh, crowded in lots of resources for initiatives like ATI, DAISY, Digify, Digital Financial Inclusion, which has funded dozens of research projects and partnerships like the one that, she, one of which she's going to tell you about uh, around the world. She's also been the pioneer of our Africa Scholars Program, which has mentored dozens of African scholars. All right, on fun facts, uh, uh, <laughs> Tavneet also... Uh, 
Yes, you did say no. Uh, uh, Tavneet uh, is just handed over chairmanship of Voxdev. I know many of you are kind of followers and fans of Voxdev. So it was a huge uh, public service to, I think, the community by creating that. Uh, and then finally, uh, even though Tavneet by birth and upbringing is an African, um, Africaner, like uh, she's a Punjabi at heart, which warms up my heart always. So uh, welcome to both of you. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, like I've been introduced, I'm Miriam Lacare from Give Directly. First of all, a very happy birthday to Jay Paul. And on a personal note, my 10 year old daughter got elected head girl in my absence, and I told her I would make this presentation in her honor. So um, today we're making a presentation, of, of course, a collaborative uh, presentation. But before I get into that, I'm going to give a background of what Give Directly is, or someone is moving the slides. Great. So initially I was wondering whether I should even talk about what Give Directly is until today. Thank you. Until today during lunchtime when I talked to someone about cash transfers and they're like, cash transfers, what are those? And so I was like, we need to talk about this. So for those who may not be uh, familiar, Give Directly is an international NGO, a charity organization that does charity through transferring direct cash to recipients. And at Give Directly, we believe that recipients should have the dignity to make decisions for what matters best for them. And therefore, we believe that cash enables choice, but on top of that, it, it should be unconditional cash transfers. Today, Give Directly has um, directly given cash to almost 1.5 million recipients across the globe. We have raised close to $1 billion for our recipients. We have worked in 14, country, 14 countries around the world. And to date, 20 of our programs have been evaluated using a randomized control trial, one of which is going to be presented today. And the efficiency rate of our programs is 90%. And by that, I mean out of every $1 or $1 Euro that we raise for our recipients, 90 cents of it ends up in the pockets of recipients. Currently, we are present in 12 countries around the world. And by being present, I mean we have our offices in 12 countries around the world in all the continents, apart from um, Australia, as you can see. Uh, we partner with institutions, with governments, with corporates and individuals in the, um, as we try to end poverty. So at Give Directly, we leverage technology, and especially the mobile technology. Right now, in 96 countries, mobile money exists. And by mobile money, I mean people using their phones as banks. And they may not even be connected directly to what we formerly know as banks. And in these countries, over 1.2 billion accounts are registered in mobile money. And so Give Directly leverages that to transfer, first of all, to enroll participants, and then to transfer cash directly to their accounts, and then to monitor the transfers that they have received. So over the years, about oh, slightly over a decade of existence, Give Directly has developed deep expertise in tailoring cash programs for particular communities, for managing operational challenges, but also for um, looking at key outcomes. We deliver cash in multiple ways, but mainly in four buckets. The first one is what we call transformational cash, and in some places it's called cash for graduation. This consists of a large cash transfer that is given at one time as a lump sum. On average, it's about $1,000 per household. Why we do this also was on the basis of an RCT that was done when Give Directly was just starting, where um, households were given either floor payments, which is multiple payments over several months, and some households were given cash transfers as a lump sum. And what we found, that what the researchers found was that households that received their cash transfers as a lump sum used some of it to meet their immediate basic needs, but they had enough excess so that they were able to start businesses going forward. And as a result, our transformational cash is a large lump sum. The way we give it is in places where we work, first we identify a geographical area that is in poverty, and we use government data for this, census data, because that is objective. And then when we go to a geographical community, the entire all the households in that, in that geographical area are, are eligible to receive cash. They're free to opt out, but otherwise they all receive cash. 
Sometimes we work with partners whose interest is specific. For instance, if a partner like Save the Children is interested in households with pregnant women and children under the age of two, we do what we call demographic saturation. That means every person who meets that criteria in that geographic region gets cash transfers. The reason we do it this way is to reduce the, um, the incidence of conflict within the community, so we want to make sure the targeting method is objective, auditable, and easy to explain to the communities. The second bracket is basic income, um, which we're going to talk about today. The transfer sizes are usually made to meet people's basic needs, and it's given multiple times over um, several months. The long, we've done it in Malawi, we've done it in Liberia, but the longest running is what we have in Kenya, and it is 12 years. Our third bucket is um, rapid response or emergency response. This is for um, people who are facing either climate or non-climate disasters. Either we do an emergency rapid response immediately after the, the disaster happens. And starting last year, we now do anticipatory action for places that are frequently hit by um, some form of disaster. So we give cash in advance so that people can make decisions that they need to make before the disaster happens. The final one is the complementary cash programs, which is these days more commonly called cash plus. The way we do this is because we've honed our expertise in cash transfers, we work with partners who are specialists in other areas. So for instance, health, education, agriculture, and they deliver their intervention in places where we are doing cash. And so quickly I'll move on to the give directly universal basic income, which is the purpose of today's presentation. So Give Directly Universal Basic Income Project is running in Kenya. It's in Western Kenya, and for those who are not very familiar with the geography, that is in East Africa, right next to Lake Victoria, one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world. The pilot commenced in 2016 with 100 individuals receiving um, 0.75 cents per day, paid, um, calculated daily, but paid once every month. And after the pilot, the following year, the full program um, started, and that is a program that is being evaluated by the randomized control trial. So on this slide is the universe of uni universal basic income studies that have been done. And as you can see at the bottom, the, uh, the evaluation that is happening of Give Directly's basic income project is the largest to date with up to 20,000 participants. It is um, universal, it is long-term, up to 12 years, and it is being evaluated by an RCT. The objectives of the Universal Basic Income Project in Give Directly are three bundles, so ignore that title, the title is wrong, but it's, um, three, there were three main objectives. First of all, it was to test the delivery of a universal basic income in the setting of Africa. Universal in the sense that entire villages are receiving these cash transfers. Basic in the sense that the transfers were sized to meet people's basic needs, and it is long-term, up to 12 years, and unconditional. Um, the second objective was to test the operations of running a universal basic income, and that is why we started off with a pilot, very similar to what the, Indo the Indonesian team talked about. And that pilot was evaluated qualitatively, using narratives to inform the way we were going to implement the larger program. And then finally, what we are presenting today is we wanted to test the impact of a universal basic income project in Africa. So um, what we're doing is the RCT has four arms. Um, the first arm is the 12-year UBI, which is 75 cents per day, calculated daily, but paid on a monthly basis. And this is covering 44 villages. Then there's a second arm, which is the, which we call the short-term UBI. That one ended. People were receiving the same amount of money, but only over a two-year period. And then um, and other sets of villages, 70 villages received the same amount as the short-term UBI received, but only as one single transfer. And finally, we have a control group of 100 villages that are receiving no intervention. So for the RCT, in each of the arms, 30 households uh, per village are being evaluated. Our research team com is composed of a number of people in this room. Abhijit Banerjee, who is one of the co-founders of j -Pal. Michael Fay and Paul Niehaus, who are both economists and co-founders of Give Directly. The late Alan Kruger and Tavnit, who is going to present the results that we have so far. Because we want to avoid conflict of interest, Give Directly, in this case, is the intervention. The surveys are being done by IPA, which is a completely independent survey group. I'll hand over to Tavdit now to tell us what we have learned so far from the UBI. Thank you.
Thanks. We took this joint presentation thing very seriously. <laughs> As you can see, we picked a project and decided to kind of describe how we got there. Um, and we'll try at the end to kind of talk a bit about the collaboration more broadly for people who are interested. Um, I just thought it would be useful to give a teaser of the results since we have them. And these are the two-year results. As Miriam said, let me just kind of rewind a little. Um, the, the, the intervention was designed with this core idea of a universal basic income, which is kind of this long-term sort of consistent income delivery to people, right? So it's a 12-year program delivering income every month. Uh, universal, we try to do universal forever, but it turns out forever is really hard to price. Um, and so 12 years was about as good as it got. Um, and then the idea to sort of, you know, this is why the collaboration with the research team is useful. That was kind of give directly main idea. They wanted to understand what this does. And we sort of thought, we don't want to test it against a control. It won't be shocking if it does better than nothing. But can we test it against other things that kind of in our minds matter or have been shown to work or that we think could provide some changes that might have dynamic effects that would compete with something like the UBI. So we designed it to sort of benchmark it, not just against a control. We have a control, of course but also to benchmark it against a two-year version that gives a stream of payments for two years, as well as the lump sum, which is actually the net present value of the two-year, right? And so if you think of poorer households, you might think, oh, you know, liquidity constraints matter a ton. Maybe the two-year is enough to kind of push you out of poverty and take off, and then the 12 years is not necessary. Okay, so, uh, uh, and there's a big literature in, in economics around these graduation programs that are kind of these not quite, but big push events where you give a bunch of money or a bunch of assets together and this kind of drives people out of poverty potentially. So that was the idea is not just to kind of evaluate this UBI, but also benchmark it against things that are gonna be one, significantly cheaper, and two, might have some sort of significant effects based on what we know in the world so far, actually driven entirely by other RCTs in the world, right? The second one looks a lot like what is the standard cash transfers that are done. They usually last a couple years and they're usually like that. Uh, the last one looks closer to the graduation programs. Okay, so I'll give you just a very quick set of results, just teaser results. Uh, feel free to find Abhiji to talk more about the rest. Uh, notice I didn't offer myself, find him to talk about them. Uh, but I wanted to do that just to sort of kind of start to get us to think of why this kind of particular collaboration was useful, right? And we're not just testing what GD wanted to test, but we're able to add a bit more nuance to how we think about this, given what we know uh, in the state of knowledge from the research world. And together, that's gonna build a portfolio of interesting results that I think then others can say, okay, now we know this, we can do the next thing. So let me give a kind of flavor of results. Um, I'm gonna show them in this way, rather than in regressions, so they're easy to see. Um, and I'm going to split it by the three arms. So the long-term arm, remember, is a 12-year arm. The short-term arm is two years. And the lump sum is the two-year net present value all up front. Okay. Um, and this is all, everything is going to be in U.S. dollars uh, values. The control mean, that's the average of that value in the control group. So you can think of this as we kind of covered how many enterprises are in the control group. So owned by the control groups, I should say, owned by the households in the control groups. The average is 16, and then I'm gonna show you how much they go up. The number of hours just is a quick way to get a sense of magnitudes, the size of the magnitude, okay? So that you don't have to actually read any of the numbers. Okay, so we're gonna see a big increase in enterprises. These are non-agricultural enterprises, so think stores, private businesses, et cetera. Okay, and that actually was pretty surprising to me, uh, but we're gonna see between 30 and 40% increases in enterprises, and driven a lot by the long-term and the lump sum arms, a lot less in the short-term. Okay, and this is gonna be a picture that goes through all the results. You're gonna see pretty big effects in the long term and the lump sum. They're really not that different from each other, but the short term is gonna do worse, at least on the private sector uh, results. So I'll show you all the rest. This is um, non-agricultural revenues, net revenues and assets. Net revenues take out costs except for household labor. Uh, and you're gonna see again pretty big effects in revenues and net revenues in the long term and the lump sum arms, much smaller effects in the short term arms. Okay, so you see much, much smaller ones, even in assets. These are all business assets, not household assets. So think of this as the entire private sector of these communities. And actually, sorry, I should have said this to start. This is aggregated up to the village. So this is a sense of how does the, the non-agricultural part of each of these communities look like added up to the village. Okay, so we see these big increases in, in sort of business outcomes. 
Uh, let me talk about work and hours, because that's often something people talk about with UBI. They're worried about wages and, and hours worked in total. So this is going to be wage hours and wage income. So this is for people who had wage jobs and wage hours. And if you didn't, these are zeros in the sample. We're going to see a reduction in wage hours pretty much across the board. Um, and we're going to see an increase that's almost as large in self-employment. So basically, as these private enterprises are growing, what's happening is people are switching out of wage work into working in these enterprises. You're going to see no effect on total hours. I didn't put in total hours because I want to give you a snapshot and not take too much time. But you're going to see the substitution of hours. Right? People start working in these private enterprises. They stop working in wage work. The reason wage income actually goes up a bit is the wage rate goes up in compensation. Right? If people are wage leaving wage work, you're going to see the wage rates go up. Okay? And so wage income is not necessarily going to go down. Uh, but you see big increases in the self-employment income. Okay, and here, self-employment is not just non-ag, it's also including ag. Right? You work on your own farm, that's also self-employment. Okay, I'll show you consumption quickly. So these are total food, consumption of protein, and consumption of education. You're going to see increases. They're actually pretty similar across the board here, and they're all pretty, they're, they're reasonable, but they're not huge. So you're going to see pretty kind of standard, what we usually see in the cash transfers literature, kind of 10 percentish effects on consumption. We do see increases in protein, which is probably good for nutrition in the longer run, and, and increases in education. OK, and then let me do wealth. I'm just going to show you total assets. So this is including all household assets, agricultural assets, and business assets. OK, and you're going to see between tw about 20% increases in assets. And then I pulled apart real estate, which is kind of land values. And here we're also going to see sort of 15% increases in the value of real estate. Um, on the second one, just to be clear, it's this not because people are actually buying more land. It's that the value of land is going up, okay, in this context. And it's because, partly because these are becoming better places to live, more, uh, there's more businesses around, there's more stuff to do, there's better jobs, et cetera, higher wages, and so that's going to drive up uh, the land price a little. Okay, so we're going to see that go up because of prices. Remember, wages also went up when we think of wage rates as a price, um, and then assets go up. So one thing that sort of puzzled us about these results to start with was if I go back to the business ones, you kind of see the long term and the lump sum doing pretty well, right? This is all done at the two-year mark. So it means like all three groups have gotten the same amount of money. The two-year just knows it's ending at two years. The 12-year knows they've got 10 years coming, and the lump sum got it all up front. Okay, so, you know, the, the, it's kind of surprising that the lump sum and the long term look so similar. So we kind of try to understand this a bit more, and we find this big increase in the use of ROSCAs. Uh, a ROSCA is a Rotating Savings and Credit Association. So this is a financial tool that's used a lot in this context. Something like 60% of households in Kenya have a ROSCA. And it's basically like if a bunch of us got together, me and Rima and Robin got together, we're going to meet every week. We each put in a dollar, and then we draw a straw, and someone takes the pot. It's a way of kind of saving communally and getting a lump sum back. And so we see in the long term, you can see loads of people are using the, the ROSCA to create the stream of income that they're getting in their UBI into lump sums. Okay, and this explains why the lump sum and, and the stream of income look the same. Uh, there's much greater use of these ROSCAs, much more money going into ROSCAs. Because remember, most people do have ROSCAs. It's about the money going in. So you can see an almost 70% increase in the, use, in the amount of money going into the ROSCAs. If we go back and try and compute how much of the UBI is going into the ROSCAs, it's about 20%. So it's quite a substantive amount of the UBI going into these ROSCAs to try and create lump sums. Okay? Um, and that's why on the business side, they look really similar to the lump sum. Okay, I am almost out of time, so I'm going to wrap up right on time. Um, you know, this is the two-year mark of something that's going to be a very long-term project. I always joke that, you know, most people want to write wills for their assets. I feel like I need to write a will for my UBI project because there's still 10 years of treatment or something to go, and then people are going to want to know long-term effects, and at that point, I feel like I need to hand it over. Um, you know, these are encouraging results. One of the surprising things is this kind of non-agricultural sector effects that are kind of unusual um, and different from the cash transfers literature, but they're only two years out. Um, I think what we're realizing is the short term doesn't do well as a two years. The lump sum 
is doing way better than the two-year, right? Even though it's the same amount of money, but that's probably, I think, the only real thing to take away so far. And I think the other thing is for something like a UBI, what you're thinking of as a permanent-ish solution to poverty, the long-term effects are gonna really matter, right? At this time, the lump sum and the long-term look really similar, but will they stay that way or not is kind of a big open question. So I think we have lots more work to do for lots more years. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, and I think what we wanted to do for the last few minutes, because I think we have three or four minutes left, is just talk a bit more broadly about the collaboration and how it came about. Come, Miriam. <laughs> We're gonna do this differently than everybody else, shockingly. Um, go for it. Great. <laughs> so in talking about why we are sisters. Anyway, so um, I think I mentioned this a little bit in my presentation. So the way we do research at Give Directly is, like I say, 20 of our projects have been evaluated using randomized control trials. And this is because essentially we are the intervention. So if we evaluate ourselves, it will not be very surprising that we say the intervention works. In this case, um, you saw um, among the list of um, the um, in, uh, in the list of the researchers, two of them are actually co-founders of Give Directly, but it made sense that we have another party that are not part of Give Directly um, participating in this evaluation. So that is a summary of the relationship. Tavit, want to add more? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I think Give Directly. The nice piece of working with Give Directly is they've had a pretty strong research mission. Mm -hmm. It's not. Sorry, thank you, Esther. <laughs> it's not everything they do that's evaluated, but they've had a strong mission around trying to design their programs based on evaluations, unshockingly, given who their co-founders are, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it also means that they do try to think about, w when they do start new things, how to bring research into the picture. And so when Give Directly started fundraising for this, I think they, they knew that some of them would be involved, but they also wanted independent researchers, partly for, not just the evaluation, but also, as I said, you know, to start with, to think through what's the right evaluation and can we possibly learn more from this than just evaluating the core program and thinking about how rightly to benchmark this. Mm -hmm. So I think technically they came to Abhijit first. Mm -hmm. Is that right? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got a call. <laughs> and that's how this research team grew. I think the other piece that's interesting is they, you know, I think Give Directly has also been working in the U.S. and other countries, um, and so you know we they did recruit Alan to be part of us partly because he had a lot of policy experience in the U.S., not in Africa, and so they wanted to sort of think through like, you know, if we want to think about the broader implications of this across the world, how would we think about it? And having someone on the team who's not so ensconced in the data, sort of in in the nitty gritty of the country that we're working in will that add value, and, and it did. Um, and so I think the nice thing has been is trying to build a team that has different strengths and brings different things to the table. Having people from Give Directly involved who can talk about the structure and the logistics of the program as well as researchers who are pretty different mm -hmm. and work in very different places and bring different things to the table. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what led to this. I'll give Miriam the last word because I think we're almost out of time. Great, great, thank you. Um, so, um, like, like Tavnit has said, um, we are a research-centric organization, and for those who don't know, the first cash transfers that we sent out into the community was actually within the setting of a randomized control trial. And um, we, we value evaluating our, our studies. Most of our studies that have been evaluated are based in Africa, and interestingly, most of them have been in Kenya. So this is one of many. And I just encourage you to just look out for the results because I think it's exciting. The largest UBI program ever in the world being done in Africa and being evaluated by a very competent team of researchers. Thank you. <laughs>